bringing this back to the panda, who's to say the panda wouldn't fare well in other habitats? The panda. I mean, it only eats eucalyptus. Bamboo. Oh, shit. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Generic Drift with me, Harvey Broadhurst, and my good friend, Adam Bakewell. How are you this week, Adam? I'm pretty good. I've, I've had a bit of a cold, to be honest. Same. We're both, we're both uh, infirm. But we're still, you know, putting ourselves out there and getting on the podcast. We do. We do, we do, we do. We're on episode eight. Return of the Jedi. <laughs> I actually know what that one is as well, because that's a new one, isn't it? Um, yeah, it would be The Last Jedi. Oh, pretty close, then. Yeah, you weren't. You were not, not too bad. Not too bad. What have you been up to this week, Adam? Well, I'm an award winner once again, Harvey. Oh, no way. What, what award have you won? The K.M. Scott Award. Is K.M. Scott a person? I don't know. I haven't Googled him. I've just taken his money. Him? You're assuming it's a him? Oh, or her. Or her. Okay, what was the award for? Best second year talk. Okay, cool. So what was your talk on? Um, my project. So, but the first year of my project. So about grasshopper life histories, basically. Well done. What money? How much did you get? How much was the, the winning? Another hundred quid. Hundred quid? That's what you got yeah. for the Vicky Dickinson Award, right? And the uh, one I won a couple of weeks ago. What was that one? I mentioned it on a podcast. People don't want me repeating stories. <laughs> and what have you been up to? Well, I'm glad you ask. Um, I haven't won any awards, unfortunately. Well. Um, I've, I've been mainly spending my time furnishing my flat. Okay. So I've actually gone out and I've, I've bought quite a few new plants. Okay. <laughs> You're never excited to hear what I've been up to. No, I am. I am. You just want to talk about your award. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not. I like to grow my plants. I don't like to buy my plants. You, you are, yeah. Okay. Well, that was, I was going to ask you because I know that you... After I, I did this originally, I was growing avocados when we were at university together. Let's not say originally. Well, I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take credit that I was the first person to grow an avocado. Yeah. But uh, I do maintain that I did it before you and I'm probably the inspiration for you to grow your avocado trees. Yeah, I'd say you were. But mine aren't uh, like a pet thing. They're a work project. Not project, but they're at work. Have you got any plants in your house? No. That you, you own. You don't? No. You should get some. There's some weeds in the back garden that I said I would deal with, so I guess I own them. Mm. Well, I've gone mad. I've got lots of plants. I bought a, a big um, parlor palm, it, which is like a, a... I know you won't know what that is, so I'll no, explain it. It's like, it's like a jungly green fanned out leaves, palm leaves, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, and it's about, about just over a meter tall. It's lovely. Okay. I bought two little outdoor ferns and they're on pots in the balcony mm. um, next to my olive tree, which I also also purchased. And I've also got, these are very popular nowadays. I'm sure you've seen these everywhere. Uh, little succulents. Yeah. Two lovely little succulents in pots on the floor. I also, obviously at work as well, I have a desk. So I had a, I have a plant at work, just an orchid that I've inherited from another corner of the office where it wasn't being properly looked after. Um, but what I really hate, and since I've been out looking for home furnishings and stuff, mm -hmm. I've noticed these everywhere from like, you know, the Wilcos and TK Maxx's of the world, all the way up to the John Lewis and Marks and Spencer homeware sort of. Well, both areas. of those two sets of shops contain things that are nowhere near the same level. Homeware? No, John Lewis and Marks and Spencer are yeah. not on the same level and neither are Wilco mm. and TK Maxx. I think they are. I think they definitely are. I don't think so. I think that I, TK Maxx's homeware section is definitely on a level with Wilco's. And John Lewis and Marks and Spencer are very similar. Marks if you went, and Spencer don't even sell homeware. Yes, they do. Of course they do. What are you talking about? Marks and Spencer don't sell homeware. Well, they don't in Stoke. Well, they might not in Stoke because everybody's getting their stuff from Wilco's. Maybe they do it. <laughs> Like that's that's an entire city of the UK that I've just alienated. But the thing is, and this is my point, right? There's one mm. item that all of these places sell, 
and I don't understand this, fake plastic orchids. Have you seen these? Yeah. But I used to work in an old people's home, Harvey. Of course I've seen fake plastic orchids. Why would anybody want a fake plastic orchid? Because it's better than them dying. But they're so easy to look after. I killed like, one. Wh- when? Um, when I lived with you. You killed an orchid? The house bought me it for my birthday. <laughs> that was probably me. You, uh, An orchid died in my, in my house, the house that I was living in. Yeah. Wow, on my watch. Yeah. Wow, okay. Um, maybe we should have got you a plastic one then. <laughs> exactly. I would have still had that to this day. I would n- no. I'd rather I'd rather a million real orchids died than live in a house with a fake plastic orchid. <laughs> they are so vile. They are ugly. We've got bee orchids on campus. Bee orchids? Yeah. I don't know what that is. It's an orchid. I think it might be the only location of them in the UK or something. Oh, cool. It okay. might not be, though. The, you, but you told me you had Egyptian geese on campus. I think a, we do. I think I've seen some this week, and I couldn't get a picture of them. Well, you should get a picture. I'll, I will. I'll, I'll find them. Please do. Please do. Oh, I, I tell you what, our, our beginning sections are getting so long now. Back in episode four, Homo Stupidus. Yeah. You talked about bringing back Neanderthals. You said that was something you'd get a kick out of, yeah? Yes. And you were saying what a shame it was that it couldn't be done because of all of the ethical implications and all of that kind of stuff, yeah? Yeah. Well, it turns out they don't care in Germany. No way. Are they bringing one back? Then, okay. That was a little bit misleading. They're not bringing one back, but we're on the next step. What's the next step? Well, this lab in Germany, it's in Leipzig in Germany. Yeah. Um, the same people who sequenced the Neanderthal genome that you talked about. Okay, cool. Um, they've done all, they've started doing all sorts of things with the genome. So already they've um, inserted the genes for craniofacial development into rats. Okay. But apparently they don't expect that they're going to grow rats with huge foreheads. <laughs> Deep brows, big noses. Yeah. I don't yeah. really know what they're expecting to get out of that one. Okay. Uh, but they've also inserted the genes for pain perception into frogs' eggs. Oh my gosh. So that could potentially tell us about whether they had a different pain threshold to humans. Oh my word. So that's that's kind of cool, yeah? That is, uh, Yeah, that's really weird. We can learn how they experience the world. Uh, relative to us or as well as that relative to ancestral humans they can also do that of course so take a a human from that time period yeah and compare it to a neanderthal i mean obviously i'm simplifying that a lot because to find enough human from back then is quite difficult but yeah yeah but now this is this is the exciting bit this is the news they're going after the brain oh my word yeah. So what are they going to do to the brain? Well, they're going to try and grow these, uh, they were described as lentil-sized. You know how big a lentil is? Yeah. I had to go and check in Katie's cupboard because <laughs> all, of, all of the different legumes, I don't know the names, but I'll eat them all. Legumes. So it's a really, it's quite a small one, yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, how big is a lentil? Uh, probably like two millimeter? Yeah. Yeah. Like a, a little circle. So they're going to grow lentil-sized brain organoids. What's an organoid? So, yeah, it can't think or feel. Right. So that's why they're getting around the ethical implications. But uh, it does have, like, some brain-like ki- structure to them. So okay. with them, you can look at the synapses and electrical activity and sort of find out if they're wired differently to us to do things like speak and form groups, apparently. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, it'll all be a bit sort of predictative, but it's it's insane, isn't it? So, I mean, what is a human? What is a Neanderthal? What is being alive? Because if they are actually bringing back a Neanderthal brain, even if it's as small as a lentil... Yeah. 
Like, is, is that a Neanderthal? Well, no, I don't think so, because it's not a full Neanderthal brain. It's not like a tiny lentil-sized Neanderthal brain. It's like, so it's grown from stem cells, like straight into a piece of brain tissue, but just, but just a tiny lentil-sized piece. So you only got a snapshot of brain at a time. So they'll be able to hint at differences in the ability to do things like plan, socialize, and learn languages. Wow, learn languages. Yeah. Because these are the things that we think is what made, has made humans so special all of this time, yeah? Yeah, our ability to think ahead, planning. Yeah. What was the other one you said, the middle one? Socialize. Socialize, yeah, I guess so. There's that sort of sense of community we have. But, but I think that this comes from the third one, learn language. Learn languages, yeah. I, honestly, when you, when you read that one out, that sort of blew my, blew my mind a little bit because... I mean, I never really considered this, but yeah. I'm sure there must have been so many different Neanderthal languages, just like there were different human languages and still are yeah. different human languages. I don't know whether we know that or not, though, do we? There must have been. There must have been. Just look at the way that languages evolve. Yeah, but they might not have be able to learn languages. You, you don't think Neanderthals did speak to each other? Well, I think that they spoke, like, but not... Not languages. I think that they made, they did oral communication. Well, what's language then? Yeah, but you wouldn't say birds tweeting at each other as language, would you? Um, I don't know, really. Maybe not birds, but I might say um, maybe chimpanzees talking to each other or gorillas talking to each other. Um, that might be described as language. And I bet that there are regional dialects if you will and accents yeah but there are of dogs species. and things aren't there are there different yeah. accents well, and sheep <laughs> are there for sheep yeah i think well, like then, I, I, but like when you take that to a level wherein um, but it's not a language well what, what the reason we have such complex language is because we've evolved um the the vocal organs right that, yeah. that can make such a range of different noises and the shape of our larynx and whatnot and and also the shape of our mouths, I'm sure, to a certain extent. Um, that's something that I'm going to go out and say Neanderthals must have had developed to a higher degree than, than sheep or, or dogs or I'm birds. not saying they wouldn't have had the tools, but there's a certain cognitive element to learning language as well. And I know that you're going to say Neanderthals weren't stupid, they painted in caves and stuff, but we don't know until these people come back to us and tell us what the brains were doing, whether they could learn language or not. And I think that at the moment, we think they can't. Do you Really? That is what you think we think? I don't think we know that Neanderthals could speak language to each other. Because... When did language evolve in humans? Um, I don't know, would be my, my honest answer. From, from, from what I've understood with studying evolution and evolutionary biology and um, in humans in particular, um, is that Neanderthals have this perception as being really stupid, but actually we do think that they were, you know, there's evidence to suggest that they were just as clever as humans. Um, and so I don't really know why they wouldn't be able to speak or, or, or communicate with language, perhaps not as eloquently as you and I are now, <laughs> but um, to the same degree as humans were 200,000 years ago or whatnot. I don't think that there is any evidence to suggest that they haven't, that they, they weren't speaking to that degree. So I, I'm, I'm open to be convinced I'd like to see what they do with these brains. I'd like to see if they find out. But until we find out that they couldn't speak as well as humans could, then I'm not going to say that they were they were stupid and I'm not going to say that they weren't capable of, of language, complex language. I think that they, they possibly could be. You know what? Couldn't I think be. you should tackle a real issue like racism. What do you mean? Like, nobody needs you to stick up for the Neanderthals. Well, I mean... I, <laughs> We're trying to keep it fairly lighthearted here. And, and yeah, you're, you're right. Nobody does really care about sticking up for a, um, a, a long extinct human species. Yeah. So 
I'm, you know, I, I'm not defending them out of, you know, empathy for the Neanderthals. I'm defending them out of a love of science and the scientific method. I, I think it's wrong to assume that they were stupid. I feel like that assumption is based on the fact that we seem to have outcompeted them. Um, no, I think that's pretty much the null hypothesis seen as n equals one animals that communicate with language. Yes, but n equals one extant hominins. True. So, you know, it doesn't... Listen, I've got nothing against Neanderthals. Uh, I'm one to four percent Neanderthal myself. <laughs> also, we talk about them almost every week. So we're both fans of the Neanderthals. You have yeah. to agree. Yeah. Well, this is another thing that the group is trying to do. So because like all European and Asian people pretty much have got one to four percent of their DNA is the same as Neanderthal DNA. They're going to be looking at whether at cells from people who are alive now and seeing whether the Neanderthal portions of the DNA are doing anything interesting like contributing to brain development or anything so then we would be able to say like oh yeah that's that's what the neanderthals have given you oh okay so to see how humans have appropriated the neanderthal genes yeah the the bits of the neanderthal that were the successful adaptations that we fixed imagine if it was speech <laughs> if it, i well i'd be gobsmacked <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't be if you uh, didn't have Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> yeah, oh, very good. Okay, so in terms of this study, what, um, what's like the next steps? What, how far along are they? So it's actually a very simple procedure. This is how you grow Neanderthalized brain structures. Okay. You want to wanna give this a go at home? So you take <laughs> human stem cells. Yeah, I think I've got some of them in the fridge. Yeah, these are the cells that uh, grow into... Any different kinds of cell, yeah? Mm -hmm. And they genetically edit them in the lab. So the editing uh, targets three genes in, in the stem cells that are linked to neurological growth. And that's only three letter pairs in the whole sequence that are changed to make it closer to the ancient Neanderthal version. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so it's so, it, because it's so close, because we're so closely related. Yeah. Well, because it's only doing such a small part. Oh, of course, right, yeah. Um, it's only making a lentil-sized brain organoid, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and then they put it in this protein formula, and it causes the stem cells to develop into neurons. Mm -hmm. And then the neurons begin to clump together and organize themselves, and over a couple of months, the brain organoids will form. Nice. And then they compare Neanderthal ones to the human ones, and look at similarities and differences between them. They're just grabbing one. They're creating, they're basically creating one lentil Neanderthal and one lentil human, and yeah. then they're going to compare them. Or yeah. like, they, they might do a few sets of, of each or whatever, but that's what they're doing, basically, yeah. Yeah. That is so strange. Lentil brains. So if you're ever in Germany. Go and have the lentil brain. Yeah. <laughs> tour. When you said it, then it sounded like a soup. <laughs> what do you know about the Dark Ages? The Dark Ages? The Dark Ages, the medieval period, some people call it. Okay, I'm glad you said that because when you said the Dark Ages, I did think the medieval era, but um, I was thinking is the Dark Ages something different? Okay. Well, so the Dark Ages is a bit of a slur. Oh, is it? Well, y yeah. It wasn't literally dark. <laughs> no, no, I suppose it is, yeah, because people were so um, unenlightened. <laughs> unenlightened, good word. I, I think that's where the dark bit comes from, like. Oh, you know? of course, that makes sense. I don't know whether that's true or not. I just came up with that right now, but it could be. I like that. I like that. Okay, what do I know about the Dark Ages? Um, not very much. My understanding of the medieval era is yeah. very much restricted to medieval England. Oh, well, yeah, the, the, so is this story, but... Okay, because I, I don't think I'm really that familiar with what was happening all over the rest of the world. Y yeah, I mean, you hear things about medieval Europe, though, but I don't know whether they'd even call that period the medieval time in, like, Asia. Would you call it, yeah, medieval Asia? That doesn't sound right, It would have just been, like, so in China, there would have probably been some dynasty at, at 
or whatever. Like, I don't think it would be referred to as the medieval period at all. Yeah. So I think you're not wrong to have it Eurocentric. I don't know when the medieval period started, and I don't know when it ended. So I'm going to guess that it started at around maybe, uh, just saying this, absolutely throwing it out there, 1200s, all the way up to, I'm going to say the 1600s. I think it was probably a bit earlier than the 1200s. Should we look this up? Do you mind yeah. if I look this up? I don't mind sounding wrong, but um, I would quite like to know. Medieval, the Middle Ages. It was from the 5th to the 15th century. It's a long time. And it merged into the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. Okay, well, if you're on the Wikipedia page, then you're going to be able to tell me many more things about <laughs> medieval. Well, I won't do that. I, I think let's suffice with, I don't know much about the Dark Ages. Yeah, okay. So it's traditionally thought of, though, as a low point, certainly for science, yeah? Yes, I would agree with that, yes. And we are a science podcast. We are, yes. So what if I were to tell you that researchers are beginning to challenge this? Oh, really? I first heard about this... Um, a speaker came and gave a seminar last year. And then I saw the speaker post on Twitter and I was reminded of what, what like an interesting story it was. So I'm bringing it here to the podcast, but the actual article is a few years old now, probably. Okay. Freya, the woman who came to speak for us, her job is combing through medieval texts, potion books, recipe books to try and solve the antibiotic crisis. Okay. In, how how would, does that help the antibiotic crisis? Well, so, you know, we've got a lot of antibiotic resistance at the moment. Yes. And it's it's quite difficult to develop new drugs. Like, what the way we usually make new drugs is, like, the same types of drugs and just change them slightly, yeah? Yeah, we take a molecule and we alter it through some sort of chemical process. Yeah, so that the bacteria are no longer resistant to that particular version of it. Am I, am I wrong in assuming that penicillin was the first antibiotic and no, that pen that's right. and uh, okay i might be completely wrong about time scales here then or timings of penicillin but i would have said penicillin was like the 1800s that's not the dark ages no how are the dark ages helping with a drug that wasn't invented until let me get the exact date because i might be wrong no you're you not wrong this is the exact thing that's amazing about this story Okay, you get the date of penicillin, and then we're going to blow your mind. 1928 penicillin was discovered. Yeah. I think we can officially say not the Dark Ages. Not the Dark Ages, yes. There are people alive now. Who were born in 1928, yeah, or yeah. earlier, yes. So in their pilot study, which they published a year ago or so, they took a recipe for, that was a 1,000 years old, which was for an eye salve. It's called Bald's Eye Salve, yeah? Yeah. And it was used in the medieval times to treat what they called a wen, but we would call it a sty. A you know? sty. Okay, yeah. So if anybody doesn't know what a sty is, I they're absolutely gross, aren't they? Is it like a blocked tear duct or something? Uh, is... So it's an infection of your eyelash follicle. Ah, uh, okay. So you get like a, a lump, like a painful to touch red lump on your eye with like a white tip like a big old white head right yeah and it's uncomfortable yeah. to like blink and like have your eye open it's just really uncomfortable yeah 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 so most commonly though that infection is caused by staphylococcus aureus yep yeah so which is the sa of mrsa okay yeah or the s of mercer for our american listeners <laughs> thanks for doing that <laughs> you okay so they took this thousand year old recipe which was wine garlic onion delicious <laughs> yeah lovely uh, ox gall <laughs> which is just um like bile salts that you can get from any health food shop nowadays but i'm guessing it was probably fresher at the time can you get them from holland yeah, and barrett it's, it's bile o salts ox gall it's yeah it's this it's it literally is like if you google it then you can you'll see that it's not an uncommon thing and it's it's just what, it's a health food supplement. Bile salts. Yeah. Extracted from the gallbladder of an ox. I think they use cows now, but like it's the same thing. Like okay, it's a compound in the okay in sure. the gall. Sure, sure, um, sure. 
So then you mix those all together and you leave them in a brass cauldron for nine days. This is mental. <laughs> this is witchery. Leave them in a brass cauldron. Like when I read about stuff like this in, in say, Harry Potter, and yeah. they say you've got to stir it left three times, right yeah. one time, leave it in a in a golden cauldron for a week. Like yeah. this, I thought that was fiction. You're telling no, it's me just that, the past. That, that is just the past, yeah. Okay. Well, they didn't have a cauldron, a brass cauldron on hand, as you might expect. Right. They, they can't get them from the suppliers, so they just got some little sheets of brass that you'd get, like, in a chemistry set. Yeah, And okay. chucked them in and left it for nine days. So, surprisingly, not maybe not surprisingly, like, we, all, we know that there's uh, antimicrobial compounds in garlic and allium species and, and why, what, you know, we know that they have active compounds in them. And copper. Copper's in brass, right? Yeah. And copper, copper, yeah. Copper is a a um antimicrobial material, isn't it? Yeah, people make bed frames in hospital want to make bed frames in hospital out of copper, yeah. Yeah, and doorknobs. So that stop. MRSA can't stick on them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so okay, cool. Yeah, go on. So they found that not only did it work uh with well established Staph aureus biofilms. But it also knocked out the MRSA as well. What? In mouse wound models. Oh my God, in actual models, in actual yeah. animals, not just in a Petri dish. Even more shockingly, right? Yeah. All of the ingredients seem to matter. No way. Yeah, if you took any of the different pieces out, it didn't work as, like, it lost efficacy, it lost potency. The brass mattered. Even the leaving it the nine days, like a, exactly nine days was the right amount to get it the most biologically active. That is absolutely crazy. So we think of these medieval people in their little <laughs> apocatheries, yeah. like being quacks, but they didn't just guess this. They didn't just guess nine days. They didn't guess these ingredients. There must no. have been scientific method. Yeah. And the improvement of these recipes to get it exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Testing and iterations to get it perfect. Yeah. To get to actually get this the salve down to <laughs> Yeah. That 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 is there must have been clinical trials involved, yeah. right? Not yeah. in the way that we do them today, but in patients they would find, oh, if you leave it for nine days They wouldn't have even had the Petri dishes. No, of course. They would have had to test it in Anim, um, in humans, presumably. Oh, yeah, we couldn't have just given animals diseases as and when we want to. No, that's true. When you were rattling off the list of ingredients, yeah. I was thinking in my head, yeah, how many of these actually matter? Like, yeah. it's going to be the garlic, and that's it. Or, yeah. or it's going to be the, the weird bile salts, and that's I it. I was exactly the same when I was in this seminar. And then she announced... She showed the graphs. Like, I wish I had graphs to show you. Yeah. But it's a podcast. You can take my word for it. <laughs> and it's insane. That is that is so cool. So I wonder how many other texts there are with treatments that are just as good as this one. Well, in term, we don't know how good they are, obviously, because this was only a pilot study and you would have to test them out individually. But, I mean, the book that that was taken from had hundreds of other recipes in it. Wow. And there are hundreds and hundreds, thousands, maybe books. So, and how many has she tested? Did she say? Um, no. Maybe this is presumptive of me, but I'm gonna say that not all of the recipes in the book are as good as that one. And also, not all of the recipes will be to treat something specifically caused by uh, an infection of something of a bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be a lot of things in the books that are just nonsense because. We didn't know what they were treating. Do you know what I mean? Oh, okay. I see. Like yeah. a sty is quite an obvious symptom and to apply something to a, a sty is whereas like with like things that cause internal pain or something. Yeah. Where we didn't know what we were treating. I, well, because they didn't know that they were treating an infection then. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. As in, yeah, they, they there was a lot of guesswork involved and they accidentally got some things right. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess is what you could say we do anyway. It's just well, that yeah. we we have more control over, um, you know, the the reason we find molecules is because we're testing thousands every day, right? 
exactly a comp- but the and still the drug discovery pipeline is like stalling like a stuck on these same tried and tested recipes back to what you were saying earlier when i was reading out the instructions about putting it in a brass cauldron and leaving it for nine days and it being seeming ridiculous yeah i've got an even better one. Oh no way okay I remember, so I, this isn't obviously written in a scientific journal article yet anywhere, but I remember her saying that like in some of the recipes you'll, you'll read it and it'll say something like, leave it on an altar for four masses. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. What do you think that means? Um, what do I think that means? Just what do you think uh, that's quality adds to the potion? Okay, so you're, you're taking some sort of concoction and you're yeah. putting it in a... In, on a church altar for yeah. the time period in which it takes for a priest to deliver four masses, which yeah. I, I I don't know how often mass is. Is there one a day? So is that four days maybe? It was one a week. One, oh, right. So four weeks. Yeah. I think that the things that could potentially be doing there, incubating. Um, also, churches are very cold. So refrigeration. Exactly. Yeah. I, that, those are the only two that I can think of. But I mean, to read it in a potion book, yeah, you wouldn't think, well, actually, no, at, at the time, their version of a scientist has tried leaving it on a church altar for different amounts of times, maybe has tried leaving it in different places, yeah, and hasn't managed to find this recipe that works perfectly, that in the modern equivalent of a fridge for four weeks... Is the right is the perfect amount, the exact right amount. Uh, I see exactly what you mean. Again, it's like they've accidentally worked out what we understand nowadays as refrigeration. Yeah, incubation time, like the amount you need to let it, the compound become most active, most uh, give it the highest efficacy. Efficacy is the word, yeah. 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 But what what we would do nowadays with our understanding of the scientific method is if we found out that it was uh, it took four masses in a church. Um, for this thing to work properly then we would um, think hmm okay what is it at play here is it the temperature and then we would replicate that study and we'd take it somewhere else where it was warmer but have a priest still deliver four masses or something like <laughs> that would change check it in different churches fully factorial exactly we would work out whether it was the priest imbuing these powers onto this um, concoction or the the temperature right and that's that's what our understanding that's how we've got a better understanding but them not knowing any better they have assumed because they believe in the divine intervention of god they've assumed that that is the the uh the catalyst for why this works but not with bald's eye cells that one was just leave it for nine days so there that is just there you could argue that so the one example makes them still seem somewhat unenlightened although lots of people still believe in god now so maybe i shouldn't say that but the, the eye salve certainly makes them seem a lot more enlightened than we at least thought they were. Like, you, you would come across these texts and dismiss a lot of it as just mumbo-jumbo. But it works. Yeah. And how much has been not even lost to history, just overlooked by history, because we found something else first with our scientific minds. Obviously, these things worked. Because if they didn't work, people wouldn't believe them, right? Yeah. People might not get the right reasons. They might not understand why they worked and they might equate that to, you know, divine intervention. But um, nonetheless, people need a reason to believe things and people always believe in results. So yeah. it makes sense for people to believe these things. What I think is really interesting, and I was thinking about this the other day because I was thinking about um, Greek mythology and how people, you know, what people believe back then, um, you know, these real complex genealogies of gods who had titans who were themselves gods and all this sorts of stuff. Yeah. And they believed in all this and they believed in it because of things in the natural world that suggested that these things, ca- that these things existed. Volcanoes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. And the song. And, and just like, just like this, um, this doctor in a thousand years ago coming up with these recipes yeah. and and getting the recipe right because they believed in things that they you know they saw some evidence for something so it 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 must have sort of reinforced a belief in them i think we as humans nowadays we must be quite naive if we assume that humans in 2000 years aren't going to look back at us and think oh my god can you believe they only discovered antibiotics by somebody leaving a piece of bread out or something like that? <laughs> 
They <clears throat> and also the, our understanding of science and even things like Einstein's theory of relativity and and gravity and evolution and all of these theories that we have that really we kind of understand but don't fully understand in 2000 years science is going to have evolved to such a degree that these people are going to look back at what we believed and they're going to think wow they really weren't that enlightened so we're going to go to space back to space back to space but i think you're really going to like this one okay okay i often do yeah no it's true it's true and you recommended um, that book by Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw to me, didn't you? Exactly, yeah. What's that called? Universal or Universal, something? Universal, yeah. Really good. Really good book. Really good read. Um, I'll start with a question. Okay. Are you familiar with Alpha Centauri? It, it, it sounds familiar. Yeah? Is it some sort of system of something? It is. It's a star system yeah. that consists of three stars. Yeah. Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. The third one is called Alpha Centauri C, obviously, but also yeah. um, is named Proxima Centauri. Okay. And um, it's a red dwarf. So the other two are full-blown stars. This one's a red dwarf, so a lot smaller than our sun, mm -hmm. um, but really, really dense and whatnot and burning with a red hue. Proxima Centauri is well known for having an Earth-sized planet which orbits it um, in the so-called habitable zone. So that's where Earth is around the sun. The Goldilocks. Habitable. Is that what, what do you mean, the Goldilocks? People call it the Goldilocks zone, don't they? Because that's where liquid water can exist. Because it's just right. It's not too hot or it'd boil. It's not too cold or it'd freeze. Okay. It's just right. Okay. Well, so yeah, I suspect this planet, uh, it's called Proxima Centauri B. Um, this is... Um, orbiting the red dwarf and it's in this habitable zone so it's an, an interesting planet yeah another thing that's really interesting about this system it's the closest star system to our own solar system okay of all of the star systems out there um it's it's the closest one at 4.37 light years away it's pretty amazing isn't it anyway okay so for astrophysicists and astrobiologists as we discussed last time yeah um this planet is potentially um, a really exciting planet because it could be, you know, it could hold life outside of Earth. Outside of our solar system. Outside of our solar system. Or it could be a planet that we could relocate to in the future or whatnot. Yeah. Pending incredible advances in space flight. But uh, <laughs> our man Elon's on that, so don't you worry. <laughs> um, but exploring these other star systems is obviously such a huge challenge because of the enormous distances between them. Mm -hmm. So sending a probe to Pluto is like child's play compared to sending it to Alpha Centauri. It's 4.7 mil light years away, yeah. Exactly. So NASA's Voyager 1, which was a probe that was launched in 1977, it's the furthest probe from Earth currently. It left our solar system and reached interstellar space in 2012. Okay. And at its current speed it would take 75,000 years until it reached Alpha Centauri. <sighs> so that's obviously not practical. No. 75,000 years, you know, I think the Neanderthals were still alive then. So... Might be again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we obviously can't study Alpha Centauri with these, the current technology, right? So how do we get there within a human lifetime? Have you got any ideas? Well, I remember you telling me about those um, when we did the story about the earwig wings. Yeah. Solar sails. Solar sails. Thank you for bringing them up. That's exactly what is I wanted it? to talk about. Yeah, that is oh, it. Oh, yes. Perfect. With a, with a very slight touch. So we have spoken about them before, and these are solar sails. They work just the way normal sails work, except they use pressure from light to sort of blow them, if you will. Um, like a sail would ride on the wind on the ocean or whatnot. Yeah. So I read an article about these solar sails this week, and I think they're definitely worth exploring in a little more depth. So the problem with conventional rockets and the rockets that we've used and the rocket that Voyager 1 is on, conventional rockets need to carry fuel with them, which they use as propellant. And this fuel adds mass to the rockets. Yeah. Yeah. And so longer trips out of space or trips to further away out in space require longer or lengthier 
fuel burns, which just adds to the problem because you've got to add more fuel to it so it gets more mass. And even when the fuel is emptied and the rocket gets more efficient, the containers that stored the fuel still have mass. Yeah. So it's still a really heavy rocket and you've still got to move it. So this is the problem. And now there's a team of scientists who are running a this new engineering project called Breakthrough Starshot, a great name. <laughs> they sound like well, something from Marvel film, right? Sound, sounds like an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. <laughs> it Breakthrough does. Starshot. It does. Jesus Christ Superstar and Breakthrough Starshot. Starlight Express. That's that's a better name for it because they're pushed on Starlight. Well, we'll get there. Oh, okay, sorry. So the solution that Breakthrough Starshot have suggested, they, they want to throw away the propellant and instead build incredibly lightweight spacecrafts that are equipped with these mirror-like sails, which would be deployed in orbit once the um, spacecraft is put into orbit, um, and then the sails would open up. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is where it gets really cool, okay? So you get up there with a bit of rocket fuel, then drop off your... Payload payload and then you sail away exactly exactly but this is this is how it works okay so it's unfolded in in orbit and this is where the technology differs from solar sails so a 100 gigawatt laser positioned on earth on the ground would point and focus its laser beam at the sail and then it would through through the laser the the um the light from the laser it would accelerate the craft to up to 20% the speed of light. And I think this takes about 10 minutes by focusing a laser from the ground onto it. Yeah, but surely you, you get out of the range at some point or something comes in your way. Well, you've, you've got 10 minutes to charge it up, essentially. So you point it at, at this, this Oh, yeah, I guess you don't thing. slow down very fast. And within, within 10 minutes, it's pointed at it and, and it stays pointed at it as it speeds up to 20% the, the speed of light. And as it gets further away, it gets um, different types of light as well. It gets like due to the Doppler effect, it gets the the redshift light or whatnot. Yeah. And so it, this is this is the light that it can use. I think I think if I've understood this correctly, it's this this red light that it uses even better for more efficient um, jet propulsion. Shine a red laser then. Well, it might, I don't know what color the laser will be, but they're usually red. Well, maybe they change the color of the laser as the the sail moves away and they need it red shifting. Yeah. So maybe it starts off as a red laser on earth because you're pretty close then. Yeah. And then change and then... To, to, to like white light from earth. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Or whatever. I don't know. Maybe the opposite direction. I don't know how it works. I, I don't either. Like this confuses me, but I do know that you have a ground laser, this craft in orbit and it powers it up from thingy and sends it shooting off at 20% the speed of light it would, this spacecraft would head off to Alpha Centauri and it would reach the system in around 20 years. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's not bad at all, is it? But then you've got 20 years from sending it. Then you've got to get the data back. Which would take four years because it, it, it communicates back with the laser. So it's yeah. the light traveling so that's again. that's 24 years. And then I'm sure you'll send progressive probes and probes and probes, but... The idea of sending people to Alpha Centauri is still like thousands of years off, yeah, surely. Yeah, well, who knows if it's thousands of years Hundreds off, I don't know. Hundreds at least, though, because, you know. But but this is the thing, right? Like, with with the technology that we had in the 1970s, Voyager 1, it would take 75,000 years to get to um, Alpha Centauri. With the technology that we've built now, 50 years later, it would take 50 or 40 years later, it would take much less than that. I guess okay. Yeah, so, so point. maybe that you know, maybe there's a solution we haven't thought of yet that would enable you know heavier or larger mass objects to travel at the same speeds. Who knows? So, there's a couple of problems with this. So, obviously, because this thing's been traveling at incredible speeds, yeah, and its sails are quite fragile. If it was impacted by space debris or dust particles or anything, even the tiniest things, um, it could just completely destroy the spacecraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to combat this, Breakthrough Starshot, <laughs> love that name, they plan to launch tens of thousands of these spacecrafts every year. That's a good idea. 
in the hope that while many will fail... One of them might make it. Yeah, or, or many others. it's a others. long way. Exactly, it's such a long way. It's basically the, the turtle, the turtle's reproductive strategy, right? Yeah, releasing so many eggs just because they know that so many aren't going to survive. Exactly, all those little baby turtles run down the beach, loads of them get picked off by the crows and the crabs and all sorts, but some of them do make it to the sea. Yeah. And the ones who do make it to the sea reproduce and have lots lots of babies themselves. But that's not that I guess that's where the rocket analogy breaks down. For now. <laughs> Tens of thousands of these these spacecrafts. I, I, I think this is incredible. I can't imagine a world where we're sending out tens of thousands of spacecrafts to head to Alpha Centauri. Yeah. And when is this gonna happen? When a breakthrough star shot kicking off? I'm not actually sure on the timings. I'm not sure when they're, they're planning to do it. There's still a few things um, to work out. Apparently. Do they not have the laser yet? Um, no, because the laser is going to be the most powerful laser we've ever built. So when they build that, that you know, that there's obviously lots of engineering things to take into consideration to even build this laser. Yeah. And also finding the right material to make the sails out of. Apparently no known material has the correct properties that they need. And um, so they're looking at, I think they're looking at how they can modify existing materials well, they want something that absorbs light. No, but it needs to be lightweight as well. Vanta black carbon nanotubes. <laughs> Too heavy. Too heavy. Too heavy. These sails are going to be 10 square meters in size and weigh less than one gram, which means they'll only be 100 atoms thick. And this is according to a new study that they've published this month in Nature Materials, which I'll link in the show notes. Um, essentially, it's just it's listed all of the materials on the spacecraft. Do you want to hear some of what what it will all its components? But a single layer of of graphene that'd just be. But graphene's not going to absorb light. Mm. Yeah, true. The materials they're looking at are crystalline silicon and something called molybdenum disulfide. But neither of those have the the correct properties. They're just they've got some of the properties that they need. So these are the these are the materials that they're looking at, but they're not perfect yet. They, I think they want to modify them and work out, you know, how they create these big, huge sheets that are only 100 atoms thick. Yeah. Do you want to hear about some of the other components on these st- uh, spacecraft? Yeah, go on. So the spacecraft, actually, I haven't said this yet. They're called star chips. Star chips. Star chips. I think that's another cool name. No, yeah, that sounds like a, a partic- like an off-brand potato crisp that you get in quick save. Yeah, they do. Like next to the space raiders. Star chips. Star chips. <laughs> Each of the star chips um, will have a miniaturized camera on board that could capture surface features of this planet orbiting um, Proxima Centauri. Um, they'll have miniaturized navigation gear, a laser for communicating back to Earth, photon thrusters, and a very, very tiny 100 micrograms uh, atomic battery for power so that's what it's going to be made out of so it's going to be pretty bare bones to begin with then although you know camera sat nav sounds like any tourist (laughs) yeah i think it's so exciting essentially it means that within my lifetime we'll see pictures of another planet Uh, not another planet obviously we've already seen pictures of another planet but planet from another star system 4.7 light years away Exactly. Close up surface features of this planet. That'll be crap. Absolutely crazy. It's the advances in our understanding of astrophysics and astronomy. I feel like it will surely be huge. Yeah. It's like, imagine you're a biologist and I am. You are, yeah. But imagine your job. Award winning. Yeah, award winning. Imagine your job was to observe like the aphids on a plant in your neighbor's garden from the confines of your own bedroom. Yeah, just through the yeah. window. This is like somebody has opened the door, given you a magnifying glass, and allowed you to go right up to the, the plant and have a look at these aphids. Yeah. Well, but it's not like that, is it? It's like somebody's let me hack into the CCTV in the back garden and I'll be zooming in on the little grainy pictures. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is like that. But, you know, still really impressive. If I was housebound, I'd be glad of that. 